cloud recording started. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Martinez, can you give us the opening, please? Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning. My name is Dharma Diaz. I welcome you all, participants and my colleagues, as we begin our conversation on domestic violence and gender-based, including also COVID-19. And again, thank you all. I haven't been a domestic violence survivor, not once but twice this hearing is definitely one that has more challenges to me, but I will do my best to stay in my good space which is as a representative and as a councilwoman. And again, just thank you for this opportunity. I'm glad that I'm here before you today as a survivor and, and as a warrior. I apologize. It's been a year since the coronavirus outbreak forced the mayor and the governor to institute social in place orders. While the COVID-19 pandemic has had a global impact, which we in New York City felt more than ever, certain populations were left and continue to be especially vulnerable to many New Yorkers, victims and survivors were forced to stay home with an abusive partner or family member. This put them at risk, isolated them from their support systems and created additional barriers to Assessing, assessing survivors and services. The committee, the committee held a hearing on this topic a year ago. At the hearing, which was chaired by my predecessor, the committee heard about how many government offices that might have provided a safe service and space were closed. How the threat of being exposed to infection itself was both the fear for victims and weaponized abusers. How there was an initiative, an initial drop in calls and DV reports within the first months of the pandemic. DV agencies eventually reported a sharp increase in calls to legal clinical hotlines. Some service providers then reported double or even triple rates of prior years. The use of various chat services and eventually the state created a testing, a texting hotline for DV victims and the city launched text 911, allowing the victims and survivors for more discretion when seeking assistance. At today's hearing, we will also hear intro 2131 sponsored by council member Helen Rosenthal, a local law in relation to establishing a group, a working group, feasibility study and pilot program using community locations, provides EV survivors access to the internet. Connectivity can be a lifeline for victims and survivors of DV some predators use technology to abuse, talk, stalk victims and survivors, physical devices like phones, computers, and GPS trackers, virtual electronic accounts, including email accounts, social profiles, online customer accounts, and, or institutional educational and employment accounts, and software or platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Often when a survivor leaves a DV situation, they had to leave most of, her, of the things behind. At least half of, of employed DV survivors lose their employment as a result of abuse, which contributes to the loss of domestic violence as a leading cause of homelessness in the US. Survivors often face significant barriers to securing safe and affordable housing and gainful employment. Internet access allows survivors to access programs offering interview and coaching skills, workshops and housing assistance. And in the time, of establishing shelter place. It is also necessary for legal aid and virtual court appearances. Before I conclude my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge that April is Sexual Awareness Month. 
and two days ago was Denim Day, when we were denim in, in protest and solidarity as a survivor in a high profile Italian rape blamed her soul because of the type of jeans she, wore, she was wearing to combat victim blaming and educate others of sexual violence. Rape and sexual assault like domestic gender-based impact people of genders and of all ages and all races, cultural and economic backgrounds. In addition, the immediate physical and emotional cause survivors so frequently often from severe and long lasting consequences, consequences, which can include PTSD, substance abuse, major depression, homelessness, eating disorders, low self-esteem and suicide. But the fact of the matter is that victims, survivors are just, victims or survivors, not responsible for the violence committed against them, but more to the matter that they are survivors. Our stories are real and intense. Today we will hear from the mayor, today we will hear from the mayor's office to end domestic-based violence or ENDGBV and local providers about their efforts to combat domestic and gender-based violence during unprecedented times in New York City. I'm looking forward to learning specifically about DV shelters. I really extremely want to hear about DV shelters because I definitely know a disservice at this time is being provided. So please, I also ask you to bear with me as I shared earlier, I'm a survivor and this conversation today just put me in a good and a bad place. We will also hear from other survivors, brave individuals who have to have felt back. I like to call them warriors. Abusers wage the war on victims. Survivors continue to fight the mental war as they regain their confidence, <sighs> spirit, and reality. We are survivors because we survived what was meant to destroy us. We remain standing after the battle, continue to despite hardships and setbacks, and realize that it was quite unjust. We fought for ourselves, our lives, and our families. So please support them, support me. Treat them with dignity, compassion, respect. Recognize the strength, the courage, and the challenges that we continue to endure. And recognize the contributions and sharing them and my extremely personal lived experiences in an effort to foster healing and increase public understanding of domestic violence and gender violence in New York City. As a fellow warrior, I know how hard it is to talk about our trauma. It can, it can break and bring us back to the, bring it back to the surface that I stand with you and appreciate you. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues. I see Rosenthal, CM Gennaro, Lander, and if I've missed anyone, I'll come back and acknowledge you. I'd like to turn it over to Chair Rosenthal. Um, thank you. Let's see. Thank you, uh, Council Member Diaz. You're welcome. You know my heart is with you. Thank um, you, I know. And I'm so uh, inspired by you and your words and your efforts and your being here today. It's incredibly inspirational to all of us, both survivors and, and, not, and, and those who of us who advocate. So as an ally, I just want to extend my gratitude to you um, for being here today and for your leadership. My name is Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she and her. Again, I want to thank, uh, begin by thanking Chair Diaz for holding this hearing and for including my legislation. Intro 2131 came out of conversations with domestic violence service providers during the beginning of the COVID pandemic. We were hearing heartbreaking stories about the difficulty of reaching survivors during lockdown. And we were hearing about the lack of technology access, often referred to as the digital divide, which is continues to impact too many survivors. There are so many approaches that can be taken to address the digital divide and so many groups of people that could benefit from secure and reliable tech access. DV survivors would benefit, of course, but so would 
undocumented New Yorkers and homeless New Yorkers. A person also could often be all three. We realized quickly that there is not yet one straightforward solution. Intro 2131 takes the approach of um, creating a qualified working group, those with lived experiences to conduct a study and design a pilot project. The pilot will enable us to test possible solutions to the digital divide for DV survivors and other vulnerable populations. I'm eager to see this bill passed into law and to see the proposals generated by it. Um, and I'm very eager to hear the testimony from our witnesses today. Thank you all for joining us and for your public testimony. Uh, I also want to thank um, my legislative director, uh, Madhuri Shukla, and um, my team for their support, as well as the team of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your leadership on this issue is amazing, is divine. I like your style, your tact, your persistence. And, and thank you for continuing to assist with the committee. You've definitely be, been a, a big sister to me. And when I mm. thank you for it over and over again, your work has been amazing. At this time, I want to turn it over to our public advocate, Jamani Williams, who will have some remarks. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, thank you, Chair Diaz. But I, I want to associate myself with uh, Councilman Rosenthal's words uh, in, in describing your presence here today and, and your ability to share your story and the, the, the inspiration it's providing to so many people I know who have experienced uh, what you've experienced. Uh, I have no idea what it's like, uh, but I want to do all I can to support those who are suffering. And I know um, uh, so many of us probably uh, wanted to yell, no need to apologize uh, when you apologize for doing your opening. <laughs> but just thank you so much for the strength and the inspiration and, and grace you're showing you. leadership on this issue. Thank uh, you for your advocacy. You've been a voice. Thank, thank, you. thank you for what you do. Thank you. As was mentioned, my name is Jamani Williams and I'm a public advocate uh, for New York City. I again, want to thank uh, Chair Diaz and members of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity uh, for holding this oversight hearing today and for Councilman Rosenthal and her leadership and her bill. Uh, I would also like to thank Commissioner Noel for the work the Mayor's Office and Domestic and Gender-Based Violence has done to help survivors across the city. Domestic abuse and gender-based violence remains a major problem in our city. While federal laws have been implemented over the past few decades to address this problem, and advocates have been concerted efforts to shed light on this issue, cases of abuse and violence are still happening at rates that are far too high. In New York City, uh, law enforcement respond to an average of 680 domestic violence calls every day. In 2019, overall call crime went down by 8.6%, but raping crimes, rape crimes increased by 19%. And although rape crimes decreased by 19.4% in 2020, the change in data does not necessarily mean that less, crime, the, less of these crimes were taking place, but rather that victims were reporting less than they were before the pandemic. These statistics are horrifying and serve as a stark reminder of how much more work needs to be done to prevent these crimes from taking place. The COVID-19 pandemic has worsened the rates of gender-based violence uh, in our city. And at a council hearing held by the same committee last May, Commissioner Noel stated that there had been a decrease in survivor engagement with law enforcement and service providers since mid-March of 2020. The NYPD's domestic violence unit was also in attendance last year and explained arrests were down 43% and complaints decreased by 36%. Again, this, discrete, this decrease did not necessarily mean that there were less incidences of abuse taking place, but rather victims were not as likely to call a hotline for help or report an incident as much as they were before. At that time, domestic violence officers were not physically conducting home visits because of the risk posed by the coronavirus. Given that victims were more likely to be trapped indoors with their abuser during the peak of the pandemic because they could no longer leave their home as frequently as before. It is very alarming that domestic violence officers were not making home visits. Considering that we are in a better state of the pandemic than we were a year ago, it is essential for the department to tell us 
what exactly DBOs resume and when will exactly DBOs resume in-person home visits and how many in-person home visits have been conducted so far. NYPD crime data shows as of March of this year, rape crimes increase by a whopping 30.4% compared to March 9, 2020. This statistic is extremely concerning and it shows that our city needs to be devoting more efforts to addressing gender-based violence and sex crimes, especially during a public health crisis when victims are in dire need of support and assistance. Ensuring access to resources is an important part of the solution to this problem, which is why I fully support Councilmember Rosenthal's intro 2131. This bill would establish a pilot program to use community locations to provide domestic violence survivors with access to the internet. This legislation would create a working group which would conduct a feasibility study and produce a report. While this initiative is critical to providing resources, I'm curious as to how survivors are going to know where the community locations that provide internet access are. We wanna ensure that they know which location to go to without putting their safety at risk. Perhaps what is most notable about this bill is that six of the seven working group members will be individuals who represent community-based domestic violence organizations. If we wanna tackle this problem, we need to enlist the help of our community partners. They have the knowledge and the expertise to make certain they, that any initiative implemented by the government will not only be effective, but save lives and prevent more people from falling victim to gender-based violence. We wanna stress that the solution to this problem is not solely uh, department on law, dependent on laws and policies or the NYPD. It is also dependent on all of us. We have to collectively change our culture, our mindsets and our attitudes that directly and indirectly contribute to gender-based violence. This change in culture means having honest conversations about how many of us as men can hold ourselves accountable when exhibiting traits of toxic masculinity. It means we are teaching our young people about the importance of consent when it comes to sex. It means making survivors feel protected, heard, and seen when they come forward to report the violence that was inflicted upon them. Looking forward to hearing the mayor's office in domestic and gender-based violence explain the ways which the agency and other stakeholders are working towards this change. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, Chairperson, you're on mute. We'll take care of that. <laughs> so working on that be so techie challenge. I, again, I, I was just thanking the public advocate for, for the support. And as he acknowledged firsthand, was not an experience that he knew, but yet like the passion um, as he spoke and the eloquency shared with me that, that you, you get it. You know, so sometimes we don't have to walk the walk to talk the talk. So thank you for, for your kind for your kind words and for being part of, of our hearing today. I, I'd like to turn it over to the moderator, to Claudia Rivera, at this time. Thank you, Chair Diaz. My name is Claudia Rivera, and I am and I serve as senior policy analyst to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Note that there will be a few seconds delay before you're unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call up individuals and panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. Two minutes, I apologize. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. For today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV, followed by council member questions and then public testimony. For NGBV, we will have Commissioner Cecile Noel. And available for questions and answers, we will have Elizabeth Dink, Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel to NGBV. I will now administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Deputy, Deputy Commissioner, I mean, sorry, Commissioner Noel? I do. Thank you. And Deputy Commissioner Dink? <clears throat> Deputy Commissioner Dank. 
Oh, sorry, I do. Thank you. Commissioner Well, you may begin presenting your testimony when ready. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Diaz and members of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. I'd just like to take a moment to say, uh, Chair Diaz, I wanna thank you for sharing your story. I've been in this field for over 30 years and I know the power of survivor stories to heal, to help survivors move forward. So I thank you for sharing that power that you now have to give to others, to help them to move on. So thank you very, very much. And thank you for your role here this morning. I am Cecile Noel, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. I am joined by Deputy Commissioner uh, and, and General Counsel, Elizabeth Dank. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the impact of COVID-19 on domestic and gender-based violence in New York City. NGBV develops policies and programs, provides training and prevention education, conducts research and evaluations, performs community outreach and operates the New York City Family Justice Centers. We collaborate with city agencies and community stakeholders to ensure access to inclusive services for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, including intimate partner violence and family violence, sexual violence, stalking, human trafficking, and other forms of gender-based violence. NGBV is an office under the mayor's office and receives administrative and operational support from several city agencies, including support from the human resources, information, technology, facilities, and contracts. COVID-19 puts into sharp focus the vulnerabilities that many people in our city face every day, especially domestic and gender-based violence survivors. And it continues to highlight the barriers and challenges that we know keep people from seeking help and finding safety. Domestic and gender-based violence is, is historically underreported, and this has been heightened by the pandemic. Our top priority has been to ensure continuity of services, access to resources, and unwavering support to survivors. NGBV has taken a variety of steps to provide ongoing and new services to survivors, publicly share information about resources, collaborate closely with nonprofit providers, community stakeholders and city agencies, and provide prevention education to youth. The New York City Family Justice Centers are operated by NGBV, temporarily closed their walk-in locations on March 18th, 2020, in response to COVID-19. The FJCs quickly pivoted to a remote service model and continued to provide services through the family, through, through the FJC nonprofit service providers to domestic and gender-based violence survivors via telephone and video appointment. Since March 18th, 2020, services have been provided to 29,587 clients, including over 13,785 new clients through the FJC. Of the total clients served during this period, 28% used primary language that was not English and 7% were age 60 and older, and 3% were under the age of 18. While it is more challenging to provide services remotely to survivors who are isolated in their home with their abusive partners, the FJCs and nonprofit service providers continue to use creative engagement approaches that are developed with survivors and grounded in safety and minimizing risk. We have, in, we have been encouraged to see the new clients that, that, that new clients can identify available resources and reach out safely for assistance. In the summer of 2020, NGBV began working with the FJC partners to develop a comprehensive plan for safe reopening of the city's FJCs. Three work groups met regularly for two months to develop a collaborative reopening plan that resulted in the decision to move forward with a phased in reopening of the city's FJCs. In September, 2020, the FJC began to offer limited in-person services at the Manhattan FJC 
by appointment only. For clients citywide that could not engage in remote services safely or effectively, while also continuing to offer services remotely. Services can be accessed in person at the Manhattan Family Justice Center. Our focus primarily on crisis services and include immediate safety planning, connecting a client to case management, legal or counseling sessions, access to a computer phone, help filing for orders of protection, or appearing in family court remotely and meeting with the with with a NYPD uh, uh, domestic violence police officer to file a report and picking up practical assistance items. NGBV continued to conduct FJC client satisfaction during the pandemic. While the remote services have been in place for those and, and those surveys revealed that 94% of the respondents would recommend the FJCs to others, our services remotely have been effective. NGBV is working closely with partners to develop reopening plans for the other FJCs based on the success of the Manhattan FJCs reopening model and remote services. For the foreseeable future, the centers are planning to offer a hybrid model with a combination of limited in-person appointments and continued remote services. NGPV has also been implementing innova in an, an innovative new way to support survivors during the pandemic. In May 2020, NGBV partnered with the Mayor's Fund to advance the city of New York to launch the first ever public-private um, micro grant initiative to support domestic and gender based violence survivors experiencing safety, economic and housing challenges exacerbated, exacerbated by COVID-19. The program was administered by Sanctuary for Families, which leveraged NGBV's network of nonprofit service providers and distributed $470,000 in micro grants to support more than 375 survivors. This initiative was part of the Mayor's Fund COVID-19 emergency relief effort, and the micro grants helped to enhance survivor safety and stability during COVID. Almost all of the program's clients were, were female. 90% were Black, Indigenous, and people of color. 95% made less than 40,000 annually, and 83% had more, had more than two people in their household. 65% were immigrants. Increasing housing stability was a critical impact of the program with 35% of the grants, over 163,000 supporting rent, short-term housing, house, short housing and other housing needs. And significantly, 48% of the clients reported feeling safer after participating in the program. 44% reported that their children felt safer and 46% reported that their mental health improved. To ensure survivors and community stakeholders were aware of the, of the continuity of services during the pandemic, NGBV has been working to creatively connect survivors to online resources, particularly the NYC HOPE website, which provides educational material, comprehensive information on services available to survivors. The NYC HOPE resource directory includes information about nonprofit service providers based in communities that work with survivors in all five boroughs. In response to COVID-19, the uh, NYC HOPE resource directory was updated to include the availability of remote services at community-based at, at community organizations. Since March 18, 2020, the NYC HOPE website has had 120,659 visits, an average of 327 per day, and 35,604 new visitors, an average of 96 a day. This is a significant in increase in traffic to the website in 2020. Prior to March 18th, um, NYC Hope averaged about 90 visits per day and 42 new visitors a day. Survivors are connected to, NYC, to, to the NYC HOPE website 
the FJCs, the community-based organizations through several efforts, including Notify NYC Techs in partnership with the New York City Office of Emergency Management, a public service announcement released by Sherlane McRae, an, an, an online campaign, which included paid advertising and regular social media uh, posts and, and a social media toolkit, which was shared widely with all city agencies and council members to amplify messaging. In addition, NGBV worked closely with our partners over the last year to coordinate our efforts, uh, conduct outreach, collaborate on reaching and, and serving survivors. From April 17th, um, from, from April through September 2020, NGBV held regular calls with 120 plus nonprofit service providers and city staff to provide open lines of communication, identify challenges, troubleshoot issues, and share best practices, achievements, and address technical and, and provide technical assistance. NGBV also led a COVID-19 res response work group that met regularly from May to July 2020 to identify challenges in serving survivors, coordinate public awareness efforts, and highlight best practices. The work group engaged, engaged a diverse group of providers representing multidisciplinary services and including providers serving culturally specific populations, as well as representation from both large and small community-based organizations. While the continuity of, of direct services were a critical uh, re response to the pandemic, NGBV was also able to implement creative ways to continue prevention efforts with young people, particularly while they were in remote schooling. At the end of the 2019 and 2020 school year, while many students remained remote during the, the current school year. Through NGBV's Early Relationship Abuse Prevention Program, or as we call it, Early RAP, the city's contracted providers, Day One, Rising Grounds, Steps to End Family Violence, and the Urban Resource Institute were able to pivot to conducting online workshops and trainings for young people, providing 1,145 workshops to 8,218 youth across 43 uh, DOE middle schools in 25 different council districts. 56% of the DOE middle schools reached are in neighborhoods most impacted by COVID. In addition, through NGBV's Healthy Relationship Training Academy, our community educators went viral, creating, uh, cre creating original videos and leading virtual trainings and workshops to stay engaged with young people during an incredibly chaotic and disruptive time for schools and other youth, servant, youth serving organizations. Between March uh, 2020 through April 18th, 2021, the Academy conducted 88 workshops. We have also been focused on expanding our prevention efforts, and we are excited to launch a new initiative this year, focused on elementary aged youth through a partnership with the Mayor's Fund and supported by the Jerome A. Chazen Fund to address domestic violence, the ABCs of healthy relationships. A project, a project includes toolkits and guides for adults working with or caring for children in grades K through five to help them build foundational skills to develop healthy relationships, first with their friends and later in their intimate partners. The ABC's materials will be available soon through NGBV's website and will be shared with DOE educators as well as with families through DOE's parent university portal and other mechanisms. Now that we are beginning to move past the immediate impact of COVID, we will begin to explore the longer term impacts of the pandemic on survivors, and we will be continuing to process and analyze. We know that switching to remote services has inspired NGBV and other providers to think creatively and innovatively about how to reach survivors and deliver services in, new, in, in this new way. 
we already know that we already know that there are some great lessons learned from this experience that will enhance the ways in which we provide services. As we begin to prepare for reopening, um, integration of new methods of service delivery will be an essential piece of that discussion. And it will be critical for us to identify ways to enhance uh, survivor access to mobile devices and the internet. This year, NGBV in partnership with the Mayor's Fund has developed two public-private uh, partnerships to support survivors and minimize the digital divide many have experienced. Through a new initiative with T-Mobile, NGBV will be distributing a thousand mobile devices to survivors seeking services through the FJCs and through our nonprofit service providers. In addition to receiving a free mobile device, survivors will have the option to access discounted mobile plans through T-Mobile. And to ensure that survivors are using technology safely through an initiative with Norton LifeLock, NGBV will be distributing 2,000 free anti-spyware lic uh, licenses to survivors to secure their devices and reduce spy and malware threats. The city is here for survivors during this crisis and beyond, and we will continue to work to identify best practices and innovate approaches to enhance, survive, to enhance services, training, and outreach. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with the council, our sister agencies, and most importantly, our community partners who have gone to extraordinary lengths to support survivors during the pandemic. Thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. I welcome the questions that you may have. I want to thank you for your creativity. It sounds as if you went outside the box and, and definitely in times of struggle and need, uh, as we have been dealing with COVID and the impacts of it, we needed that. The city needed for individuals, for organizations to test new endeavors and, and see what works. I'm sure you've had some goods and some negatives and I'm glad that um, you're sharing it all with us. So I, I thank you. And, in, and the negatives and, and the shortfalls, I, I like to know what have been the biggest challenges basis that the providers are, that the, the survivors have been facing and, and sharing with you and what are you doing to try to meet their needs? Well, COVID impact for us puts into sharp focus the vulnerabilities that people in our city face every day, especially domestic and gender-based violence survivors. And it continues to highlight the barriers and challenges that we know keep people from seeking, uh, from seeking help and finding safety. We know that switching to remote operations has inspired NGBV and our providers to think more creatively and innovatively. And we're very happy with that. And with that, we are learning lessons about how to do this work in new and, and different spaces. For example, we need robust work plans to, to help think about how people on the front lines can switch and really be able to, to pivot quickly to be able to providing services. Also, we need access to emergency flexible funding to meet the needs of survivors, uh, to be able to provide diapers and medication and things like that. And survivors need access to remote services and we're continuing to look at how to do that effectively. Thank you for answering three of my questions. You're making it kind of tough. You're on the mark. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question, I will go to general operations. Since last year's May oversight hearing of domestic violence and COVID-19, in what ways has COVID-19 continued to impact ENDGV and the city support um, for victims and, and, and survivors? With regard to changes in NDVD's day-to-day -day functions apart from telecommunication, is there a plan, timeline for FJC staff to return to work in person? The FJCs, beginning with COVID, the FJCs were able to quickly pivot and carry all our services over remotely. We have continued to do our services, do it effectively, do it efficiently for survivors. There has been no interruption in our service. 
as I said, we have moved forward with opening the Manhattan Family Justice Center for appointment only right now. And we are working together with our partners in this space to think about how we scale up and open the other uh, FJCs using the Manhattan Family Justice Center as that model. Do you have any programming services you're providing that have been eliminated? You know no. what you need for? No, all of our services have continued. We, we have pivoted all of our programming to this virtual environment, and we've been able to do that very successfully with the, with the partnership of our community-based organizations. I'm going to now turn it over. For, I'm going to ask one thing of the moderator. Could I am you also, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, could, I, I want to ask one thing of the moderator as I take questions. Could you also unmute uh, Liz Dang? Of course. Um, Chair Diaz, I'm going to go over uh, some protocol before Please we do. proceed. Thank you. Uh, for the record, we've been joined by public advocate Jumani Williams and council members Gibson and Kalos. Uh, now, before we return for additional questions from Chair Diaz, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that they have a question for this panel. Um, and now back to you, Chair Diaz. I will. I, sorry, Floyd. I'm going to turn it over to a public advocate for questions. And during my second round, I will continue with my questions. I'm doing this because I know there's several hearings that are happening today, and I want to extend the courtesy to my colleagues so they can also continue to advocate for us as meetings continue. The PA, I'd like for a public advocate to proceed with his first question. Uh, the public advocate has uh, left the hearing at this time. Okay, is there any other member that has raised their hand that would like to have a question at this time? I don't see any hands raised at this time, okay. but we will keep tracking. I apologize. I see uh, Council Member Rosenthal has raised her hand. Wonderful. Council Rosenthal, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just getting the approval to ask questions. Um, um, hang on one second. I'm a little bit double um, zooming and doing two things at once. Never a good idea. Um, Commissioner Noel, thank you for everything. Your leadership has been extraordinary. Your leadership through this has been extraordinary. Um, I have so much respect for you and your team and appreciation. I don't know, I don't know how you have been getting through all this, but you've managed to get up in the morning every day and come to work and God bless you all for doing that. It's so hard. And listening to your testimony, it sounds like you've been doing some really phenomenal um, things, some of which I knew about. I know the micro grants were extraordinary. Um, sounds like delivering the, um, uh, the mobile devices and the spyware is just brilliant. I guess um, then my concern, I have a couple of concerns and then I would love your feedback on this bill in particular. Um, is, let's see, I think the funding for the agency has basically remained flat. Last year, you lost some money uh, on the PS side, but this year it's back. Is that accurate? Liz? Hmm. So we can, we can circle back with you, Commissioner Rosenthal, to, um, to confirm what the budget reflects in this fiscal year. We don't have that available right now. Okay, no problem. Uh, <clears throat> Great. We couldn't quite confirm it either. So I really appreciate that. Um, I'm wondering is a thousand devices um, 
what do you think the demand is for devices? I mean, again, with a focus on you're doing great work and I, I really, I mean, it's great you're getting devices out. Well, what do you think the demand is? Do you think the thousand is meeting demand? Well, we know that, um, that the need for devices during COVID was very high. And we believe that this is a wonderful place to begin as a public-private partnership. And with the success of, of the T-Mobile program, we'll be able to leverage that for other funders or maybe even T-Mobile again. I think it's a, it's a great place for us to start, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, and I believe that we will learn a great deal as we roll this out about what the need is how can we really quantify that in, in, in a big way? And what are the nuances of that need? Does, you know, how does that look across the spectrum? Those are things that we will be finding out as we do this. Yeah, I really hope that, um, I, I really all sound spot on. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, the budget uh, prioritizes what it is you're suggesting um, and, and the programs that you've done. Again, the micro grants, I think we're just, sounds like we're a great success. The devices, great success. Um, uh, how much of that money has come from private foundations compared to um, taxpayer dollars? The T-Mobile, uh, which yeah. is the one that we're discussing now, is a public-private partnership. So it is through the mayor's fund, and yes. and that's and the, and those are private dollars supporting this. And we are really excited that we can generate interest from private funders about this very critical issue. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's one of those that you know can grab the attention of a private donor. I totally understand that. Um, I would also argue that it's a pretty basic service that government um, should also be paying attention to. Was that also the case for the micro grants? It was through the public? That the is fund? correct. Correct. Okay. It was, again, through the mayor's fund, public-private partnership that allowed us to do that program. Right. You know, and just remembering, I, um, you gave a shout out to the nonprofits doing the amazing work on the ground and I, I, I wish I had remembered to say that. So I'm just really <clears throat> glad you gave them a shout out. It's so true that their work has been um, extraordinary during this time. Uh, and I had the privilege of working with some of them. So uh, really admire that. And I'm sorry, I am double zooming. So maybe I blanked for a second. Um, do you have any thoughts about this particular um, idea of putting together a group to, you know, like you always do, <laughs> of um, people with lived experiences to think harder about the digital divide, you know, and, and, and not only the digital divide in the sense of, well, I guess it very much is the digital divide. So giving I'm people access um, to locations. Um, Chair, may I continue for just another minute? Absolutely, take two. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so for those who, you know, otherwise can't, I think the idea in the hearing that we had was um, one of the, um, or one of the meetings, one of the nonprofits suggested, you know, wouldn't it be great if they could go to a library and there were, you know, ways to make it confidential and easy for them, um, you know, just sort of brainstorming ideas. Um, and given that, you know, we're not going to be able to give devices to all who need it or micro grants, you know, right? So, yeah, I was wondering what you thought about uh, the idea of a working group and then just a pilot to see um, what might might work. Well, you know, as I said before, the digital divide for survivors and their need to access services is quite real. 
And we are encouraged by everything that we've been doing and what we've been seeing out there in the community and we're committed. And we've been so committed that we've been able to partner with T-Mobile to do this. And so we're really, we really um, are moving forward, recognizing that it's a real need. And so we're committed to exploring all the ways that we can support survivors and, and really reducing the barriers. And, and we welcome the opportunity to discuss this legislation uh, more with, with, with the council. Okay. Well, I, I hope you stay on for the um, community feedback. We have a, a dozen, about a dozen witnesses who are gonna talk about, um, you know, in support of the legislation. You know, I don't think anyone is going to deny the, you know, no one's talking about the hardship or that's not a question. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, the question is resources. And with this idea, the concept was to have it be uh, the as minimal burden on your office as possible, because I know we are all under-resourced. <laughs> Um, but really to get, and, and minimal work for the nonprofits who are also, you know, busting at the seams um, and under-resourced. So just trying to, to find a space to come up with some ideas, think through a, um, a strategy for implementation, implementing just a pilot, much in the way that the micro grants and the tablets are a pilot, right? You know, we're, we're touching, or the T-Mobile, we're touching some people, but um, as we, and, and I've seen you in your office do this, document the success of these programs, as you said, it will help us uh, lead to more funding, whether it be private or public. You know, I'm always a fan of public, but private is good too. Um, so I, I really uh, hope that um, you could support this legislation. If, there, if we hear this afternoon from the advocates that there need to be tweaks, if you have ideas for tweaks, I really am very interested in it. But you know, we've been through a pandemic, which obviously no one, we're all flying blind about it, which limited uh, people's access to technology even more. And so I'm not, you know, I don't know, does this pilot get us ready for the next type of crazy ass pandemic? Or is it that this pandemic has exposed the, the, the um, digital divide and how very hard it is for um, many to get access to technology. You know, libraries and community centers are going to be opening up. And um, so, so the answer might not be everyone gets their own. The answer might be increased access at libraries for when people in usual, you know, 98% of our lives have been, you know, able to go to a library. Um, so anyway, you, you see what I'm getting at and um, really would appreciate um, your support for this and um, the opportunity to work with you on it. As I said, we welcome the opportunity to discuss this further with you, okay? Great, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Chloe? Yes. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, just a note for the record, we have also been joined by the Ma Majority Leader Cumbo and Council Member Dinowitz. At this time, I'd like to remind Council Members, if you have a question for the administration, that you may use the raise hand function in Zoom at this time. I apologize. I'm on another committee and they're texting me here I am. Like, like I said earlier, today is definitely a day that many of my colleagues will be jumping in and out in conversation. To, the, to those of you that are testifying, please do not feel that we're not being respectful of your topics 
And what you need to share with us is just that we're multitasking today. Thank you. So I will resume my questions unless there's a colleague that wants to make a statement or have a question. No raise hands. I see no other raised hands at this time. Thank you. My understanding is that some survivors have mentioned that they're in need of, of assistance in reference to the hotlines, call in individuals seeking counseling at the moment to vent or moments of stress. Are you promoting or offering any city led and funded programs or services related to mental health, trauma or stress? Um, as I said earlier, we pivoted to remote services for all of our services, which also includes mental health services. We have, we have on staff a, a, a psychotherapist and a psychiatrist to work specifically trained to work with survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, specifically able to understand the co-occurrence, the, the correlation, the connection between these issues and tailor their interventions to meet that. And of course, uh, the city has a wealth of services through Thrive and NYC Well that survivors can also be connected to, but we do offer those services specifically through the Family Justice Center as well. And how about for your staff? For our staff, again, and, and this is really a great point because staff also face so much stress during this pandemic. And we have engaged in wellness activities in, in partnership with our providers. We have something called Wellness Wednesday, which is a wonderful thing that we do for all of our staff that really is about yoga and mindfulness and, and, and wellness that is done in partnership with one of our um, one of our providers, which is Exhale to Inhale, and they do yoga and mindfulness, and they work with us to put together this whole program, as well as the wealth of resources that's available via EAP, and again, through Thrive, and, and through NYC Well, and that whole network of services are also available to our employees, but uh, their wellness is very important to us, and we've been centering that in everything that we've been doing through the pandemic. And, and, and you mentioned earlier having to add on um, additional services. Would you be able to give me a dollar amount or closer to a, a dollar amount of what financial assistance you have been given to be able to, in your tweaking process, to be able to provide the services that you have provided? Um, Liz? So, um, in terms, if you can just clarify, do you mean additional funding that we've identified? Because all of our programs um, that were operating pre-pandemic continue to operate during the pandemic. Um, and all of our programs were able to shift um, to remote operations with very little budgetary impact. Impressive. Impressive. Has any of your staff complained about how did you see there was every conversation on staff having issues with their own technology of working from home. I, I, I would suspect that similarly as the survivors or those you know, needing advocacy had struggles. I'm curious to know if, as, you know, if your staff was also supported by, by giving a hotspot, what were you able to do for your staff? Having an iPad, you know, now they're working remotely. And my understanding is that some agencies, some providers, so this day have had hardship where staff is using their personal items to be able to, to provide services. I think that um, we, we, like all agencies across the city, had to pivot very early with our staff as well and had to figure many things out. But what we've been able to do with our staff is provide them with um, the devices that they, they need to be able to connect and continue to do the services. Okay, great. Then I, I'm somewhat data driven, so I, I'm not sure who will be providing the answers. And I know you may not have the answers for me today, so I'll look forward to receiving the answers in the near future. I'd like to hear back. You know, my understanding is during last year there were conversations, um, outcomes, you know, your what you projected. To, to what actually was, I like to see if you, you. You mentioned able being able to provide the services. I like to at some point um, see data 
that that actually proves that to me. So I'm going to start with. Do you have the data available for gender violence? Um, for gender violence itself, how many individuals were you able to to service? Human trafficking um, is another clients during um, COVID itself. We find a hotline numbers and service trends. I, I can stop here. Or I can go a little slower and repeat them for you. I, and we would. We can certainly follow up on any of the data points that, that you would like, since some of them will require that we go back and pull some information. But, but I think it's also important to recognize that even though we've had to pivot and do that very quickly, we were able to reach from March 18th through uh, April, 29,587 clients with services through our Family Justice Center. And we're saying that, you know, over 13,000 of those, 13,785 uh, were new clients. That means that our message and the message that help is available is getting out there to survivors and a good chunk of them have never come to us before. A good chunk of them are saying, you know, I've been experiencing this and I didn't know that help was available and they saw this and reached out. So I think that in itself says a great deal about what we've been able to do during a very challenging time for this entire city, country, everyone. Um, so, so that speaks, but we can certainly come back to you with specific information around specific data points that we might not have with us this morning. Okay, so we will have staff send to you the points, but for the record, That's I'd fine. like to acknowledge what we were expecting. We will be expecting to receive data on domestic violence, gender-based violence, Human trafficking, clients, COVID nineteen status, intake, intakes, calls, and visits to the TV website, provider hotline numbers and service trends, provider chat options, trends in the types of calls to the city's DV hotline, geographic of where clients live by zip code, and the local precincts, client demographics, ethnic, gender, identity, sexual orientation trauma-informed practices and training for FGT staff as they work with clients virtually. We'll just take a, a two minute break. If anyone needs a break, get a glass of water or something. We'll resume at 11.10, if that's okay with all.
Good afternoon. It's still good morning. I hope you were able to enjoy that two minute break, get a cup of water, a second dose of coffee, or for a colleague if you had to jump off for a second and respond to another hearing as, um, again, I'm being te um, text for my next hearing. I'd, I'd like to go into questions about the quarantine hotels. I'm not sure if many of you have heard my story, but when I was first diagnosed COVID positive on April 2nd, I chose for my own personal sanity to go into the, the offered um, hospitality, uh, the, the care, as opposed to being at home. I, I did experience positive and, and negative, my, my biggest negative was needing to have a warm breakfast. And when breakfast was brought to me, it was cold. French toast and, and frittatas that just come out the bottom, the freezer, are definitely not a healthy way to, to start your day. I'm gonna to continue to advocate for hotel providers to allow for clients to use the microwave. One of my, one of my challenges was knowing that there was a microwave um, in my in my room, and there was a, the, there was nicely covered the door, and the door was um, shut in with a drywall screw. I sat on the floor and I tried to jimmy it as as a Brooklyn native could dive up and and was unable to. That to me was extremely stressful. So as you're placing families in hotels whether it's a shelter needs, please um, advocate to see if there's a, a kitchen in the unit. Some, some hotels do have kitchenettes and, and, others, and others do not. So please, um, as replacing families, let, let's try to secure that their food, that their needs are, are, are being met, not, not just a, a room over their head, but that the elements are also um, being met. Chair Diaz, I am very sorry to interrupt. There is a technical issue and we now need to pause for a moment so we can fix the stream. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I believe all is back on track. Great. It's 2020, it's technology, we're live. It's real, but as New Yorkers, we work it out and we move forward. I, I like to go back to my questions about shelters and quarantining hotels. Has NDGBV or any of its affiliates been tracking survivors who have self-identified or in our needs in DV shelters, non DV specific shelters, and of the city shelters, quarantine hotels. Describe current DV shelter capacity. How many DV survivors are currently residing in non DV specific shelters? Do you have that number? Oh. We need to unmute the commissioner. Chair, we need to pause again for one okay. moment for technical difficulties. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, Chair Chloe, looks like we're ready to go. Thank you. I'm not seeing Commissioner, is she on? I am on, I am on. Okay. <laughs> So council member, I, I, I'd like to go back a little bit because I think it's important just to share. We do have, there, there, you asked a lot of technical questions about the level of data, but we do have some that I'd like to share with you. All right. And so if we take a look at some demographic data from our FJCs during COVID-19, as I said before, we saw 20, 29,587 clients during that time and this is and this is from March 18th and 13,785 were new clients of that of that I think it's important to note 52 percent of the clients came from the zip codes most impacted by COVID 82.4 percent reported being victims of intimate partner violence 17.4% reported being a victim of gender-based violence, which includes non-IPV, including uh, family violence, non-IPV sexual violence, non-IPV elder, um, elder abuse. And what we have is another, uh, you know, 0.2% reported being vi uh, trafficking victims, 28% uh, uh, you, uh, the primary language used was not English. I think that's important. Um, so we do have a high percentage of um, non-English speakers who use our family justice centers. Um, we, have, we have a good portion who are speaking Spanish and Mandarin and Bengali. Uh, seven percent of our of our clients are sixty years and older. We have twelve percent that are males, so we know that uh, gender based violence affects uh, intimate partner violence affects more than just women. So we have men coming in to receive our services also. Um, and, and so these are just some of the statistics that I think that you mentioned that we have here today. And I did want to just also tell you that for the hotline services, the, the volume for the DV hotline increased by 17% during the pandemic. And, those, and that was from, from, from March uh, 16th, 2020 to uh, the same time, March 15th, 2021. So when compared year over year, that increased. Uh, the call volume in June of 2020 was 40% higher than in June of 2019. And the call volume from March 2021 was 37% higher than it was from March uh, 2019. So again, I just, some of your other questions, we would need to go back and take a look at that, you know, and look at those numbers, but we were able to pull some of those numbers during the break and are able to give you that as well. And so now to your other question about shelter. I think it's, it, services at the, from the FJC and our services generally are available to anyone, any survivor, a survivor in shelter, a survivor in a DHS shelter, a survivor in a, D, in a DV shelter and survivors in the community. So our services provided through the FJCs are available to anyone. It doesn't matter where you are, but it's also important to recognize that we do not oversee the, the shelter system, that is DSS. We advocate where possible for survivors when they come to us for services and they are in shelter. We do our best to advocate with the shelter provider, with the, the, the system that oversees um, that particular shelter to address whatever the needs of that client may be, but we don't oversee the day-to-day -day operations of those facilities. 
um, we certainly can and do provide services when clients seek out our service and they are housed in those places and we advocate on their behalf where we can. So in terms of um, those systems and questions that involve the actual administration of those systems, you would need to go to DSS. Okay, so then I have another question. Sure. Having come from the shelter system, my experience has been that when families move in from the TV system into general population, the relationship is disengaged and, and the families are on their own. Is, is that the case or is that just what I, what my experience? I, I think that, again, those questions are best answered by DSS, who administers those systems, but recognize that there are two shelter systems. There's a DHS shelter system and a DV shelter system. I don't know what your experience was when you say general population versus not. The DV shelter system has emergency and tier twos, and you've got a DHS system that has vast numbers of, of family shelters, as well as single shelters, as well as hotels. Okay, so when I, when I say general population, is what I'm saying for someone that's not a DV victim or who has not identified as, as a DV, DV victim. And that's what, what I'm trying to learn is once someone has been under, has been receiving the specific care for the four months or they're lucky for six months, because I have heard that there are cases, once you turn, once the families are no longer under DV specific services and guidances and, you, and the family goes in, into a, a standard shelter, which I call general population, your relationship ceases to, to exist with the family and it's turned over to the case manager and the new shelter where they are to assure that families receive services. I think that that is often the case because they that shelter is now housing the family. But again, these questions are best discussed with DSS who, who operates or administers both systems. But I can assure you that every effort is made to ensure that families are connected to the services that they might need, the services offered in shelter or maybe out of shelter. Okay, thank you. I'm going to apologize to you all, but I have another hearing, general welfare. I'm gonna jump, jump into that hearing from my statement and I'll be back. I'm turning the hearing over to my colleague, Lander. Are you ready to resume responsibilities? There you go. Yes, he is. Thank you very much. Hang on, my apologies. I'm on two, I'm on the hearing twice and I have to turn off my other Zoom. All right, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, okay, Commissioner, thank you for your testimony. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that it's uh, in this hearing, especially uh, uh, humbling to try to fill the, the shoes of our chair, Chair Diaz. Um, and I wanna echo what the public advocate said at the beginning of his testimony, um, uh, speaking to the importance of allies being here to show up for survivors and stand with this system and be humble in understanding you know what we do and don't um uh what we do and we don't know so i just appreciate doing that and i appreciate commissioner the work that you are here describing um all right so let me um Council, should I continue with the lines of questions here or should we move forward to listen to the to the folks that have joined us for this for this hearing. I, I earlier I saw someone raise their hand for questions for the the administration. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, do you still have any questions? Um, Chloe, if you're, I can't hear you. Oh, I, I said council. I never mind. I, not available anymore. I believe you can continue with the line of questioning or. Councilmember Lander, can you hear me? 
Oh, sorry. That was on my end and not on yours. I apologize. I had fixed okay. it, but not my volume. Uh, you may continue with questions. Okay. All right. Then hang on one second. I need to get to those questions. Great. Okay. Uh, Okay, um, I, I, with, with my apologies, so I, I just have, have lost my thread in the, in, the, um, in the script we have here. And I have found this back and forth really useful and I appreciate your point, Commissioner, that a number of the questions we have about folks' experiences in the shelter system and moving through it, we'll need to follow up on with, with DSS. So I think that will be a, you know, we've had a lot of conversations with them and, and I look forward to more. Um, I guess let me maybe ask, just following up on the question, the, the implicit in what the public advocate and I have said, if there's a message to folks who are looking to be better upstanders, who are looking to participate in spreading the word, in listening to and paying attention to signals, in thinking about what's going on in our communities as different as they are on our blocks, in our synagogues and churches and mosques, um, how, how, can we, how can we do that? How, how can we do that better? It begins by first knowing the resources that are available in your community, in your city. It begins by really, I think, spending a little time seeing what's available on NYC Hope and understanding what really is intimate partner violence and how it really affects survivors living that could be living, could be your neighbor living in your community. And recognize that we need to approach survivors without judgment and understand that, that we need to be guided by what they need. But we first need to be aware of what resources are available. And that's the first step to, to actually reaching out and saying help is available to someone that you might see. Sorry. Um, and can you just tell me a little bit, I guess, in terms of resources for um, community members? What are some of the resources that you... That Certain, well, certainly we have the, the Family Justice Centers, which are um, which right now are appointment only, but we are still providing services remotely. We are still uh, helping survivors navigate their safety issues, uh, provide case management and counseling. There are also community-based providers that, that are housed within communities that are listed on our um, NYC HOPE website that you can share that so someone doesn't have to go and have halfway across the city. They're providers that are in their community. And it's important that um, if you look at our NYC HOPE website, connecting with those uh, service providers so that uh, survivors can feel like there's someone who knows me, knows my community, understands my culture, we have culturally specific orgs that can relate and be able to deliver the services most comprehensively. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Chair Diaz may be back. Chair, I, I said you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> well, Chair, I do just want to add my voice uh, to the other members who are praising your leadership of this committee and of this hearing especially. It takes courage to, to be vulnerable, to speak about things that are really extremely difficult, and then to but it's, it provides a kind of leadership, which is really the most powerful way that we move forward. So I'm honored to be a member of this committee under your leadership. I wanna thank you for this hearing. I feel pushed to, to show up better on it as a result, and I'll say thank you. Thank you. It's important to know that there's strong men like yourself, and they can identify and know that you're needed. You know, we, we, as, as I was preparing again for the conversation today, I, I was hoping that individuals would understand that. And sometimes we have employees or we have friends that don't show up somewhere, you know, and the reason why they show up. And I'm gonna take this moment to share, being that you said that, I like to, to share when it was that I took my life back. When my husband, who's now is deceased, my younger sister, my baby, who was a military vet, 
Um, I come back from Iraq and it was her engagement party. And I was told that I couldn't go. I stood in my window and at that moment said no. As my husband went to sleep and tears were coming down my eyes, I said, I'm taking my life back. I'm gonna go back to work. I'm gonna go to school. And I'm happy that, so he passed like three months after that. But I'm glad that I was able to find that strength within myself and to start my journey and having the conversation with my abuser and letting him know enough was enough. You know, he, I called the cab and I went to my sister's and I celebrated and he figured out where I was. And he said, why did you leave? I would have taken you. And I went on and no, and I'm glad that it wasn't a, a confrontational moment. He understood that I was tired and enough was enough. And at that point, he, he was suffering from medical illness and he, but he was still mean and he was cruel. And as I was trying to learn about his system and his body and what was happening to him and I got to local library, I must have had 10 books. And I wanted to learn. I mean, he was my husband, he was my partner, my, my daughter's father. And, and he says, he says, if you're celebrating my death, I was like, no, I wanted to, even in my own pain that he was causing me, I wanted to understand him and his pain and knowing that he was gonna die of an illness, he was dealing with it with his liver, you know, and we know what it comes to. And as I was still trying to advocate for him and be somewhat compassionate, he used that against me. But I, you know, I, I guess at this point I could thank my, my baby sister, Jesse, for going on to the military and coming back and, and being my anchor because my love for my baby sister allowed me to say no more and, and enough is enough. Mm. And, and you know, my, my family, and I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna move on to our questioning. My family saw bruises on my body and my arms, I remember specifically one day and said, oh, you're rough, you're tough. Stop moving furniture around. No, that was a beating that I had survived. That was the marks of it. And I, it's okay, it's okay. I, I'm, I, I'm talking no. about it, but it's real. Let's go ahead, sir. No, go ahead, please finish. No, no, and I say to say that we need to be a little more mindful, right? When someone says, when you see a bruise on someone, hmm, look, look for, for, other, for other reasons, right? Or as during COVID, as people are isolating, and we know that a lot of the trauma has escalated during that, let's call that extra person hmm. and try to listen to this. If they were family oriented and now they're not, you know, look at their attire, right? Do they look sloppy? Like, is there something different? Some of us survive because we do. My family didn't truly know what I was, what I had experienced. So we were going through his burial process. And we were at the funeral parlor and they were glorifying him. And I said, it's time for me to tell you the truth. This was my experience. And my family could just apologize because they didn't know of my hardship. Mm. But I didn't want to endanger my family anymore than, than that, sir. But we'll, we'll go back and it's a story and we tell it. But, but Chair yes, Diaz, sir. you've made yourself a powerful witness at this hearing. Um, and I don't know if you even heard the question I asked the commissioner because you were on the other hearing, but the question I asked is, how can uh, allies, family members, neighbors do more to pay attention, to listen, to show up? And uh, without even knowing that was the question I've asked, you've given very powerful witness testimony of like what it means, you know, not just a neighbor, not just somebody across the street, but just to pay attention within our own families um, and, and dig a little deeper to be aware and to be able to show up for people. And it could be uh, life-saving. So your, your, your witness and your example and, the, and what you've done since that time to become a leader and be here chairing this committee is the kind of example that we need in New York to move past this crisis and uh, rise to something better. So, so thank you for answering my question that you didn't even hear I asked, but thanks even more for your powerful witness and, and testimony and, and example. I just know that men, men get abused too. And I just, I, in, in full transparency, mm -hmm. but men is more mental than physical, but for the dads out there that are trying to stay in the lives of their children, do know that as the chair of this committee, I am mindful of your hurt and, and your pain. So I, I just thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll see to the questions and we'll go 
we go back. Thank you again for the opportunity. I like to go I'm toward and have a conversation geared to the outreach for the transgender community. And we have specific outreach that, that, that has been done. And then of course the LGBTQ, but I wanna start with anything specific that's, that's been done for transgender. We agree that, um, oh, thank you, am I on? You can hear me? Yes. I can hear you. <laughs> we engage uh, with providers serving LGBTQ plus populations regularly at events and workshops. For example, we're doing one this weekend on Staten Island with, Stat with the Staten Island Pride Center. And we're careful and we're careful to ensure our messaging in all of our outreach efforts are inclusive. We also do a great deal of work with immigrant and non-English speakers. Um, we collaborate regularly with Moya on, and, and we held town halls in Bangla um, together last year and we're planning for this year an Arabic and Creole. We conduct our cosmetology um, outreach in immigrant communities and work directly with consulates and immigration serving organizations. So we are very committed. Our partnership includes our community-based network, includes many, many providers who are culturally specific orgs. Wow, your, your feedback is amazing. And, and uh, your, your word red like me, red, red is, a, is a power color. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to say that. Yes. <laughs> Women, women need, you know, I, gotta, I just got to say, so that thank you to all the women that are participating here today and for all the men that are supporting the women in, in, our, in our journey. I'd like to have a little more a conversation reference to, to NYPD and your relationship with, with NYPD. Do you, get, do you normally get the assistance that, that is needed, the privacy? I know it could sometimes um, be somewhat difficult for, for a survivor. Can you please share with me perhaps a story, A, a your general relationship with NYPD? Do you think this time that it can improve? Um, and if so, recommendations on how we can give suggestions. We have, we have a wonderful collaborative and great working relationship with NYPD. It's important to note that NYPD domestic violence police officers are part of the complement of staff that are housed in the Family Justice Center. So they are in fact a wonderful partner. They, um, we've provided trainings together. We work on tip sheets together. They have been wonderful. Um, they're wonderful allies all the time, wonderful partners all the time, but particularly during COVID, um, um, NYPD uh, used our, our like fact sheet um, around how, how to engage with survivors who are now at home with an abusive partner. How can they, from a, just from an NYPD standpoint, be cognizant of what might be going on and figure out um, better ways to um, help that survivor access services as well. So um, in terms of the partnership, uh, we think it's wonderful. It can only get better. And we, we are about working towards making sure that it stays strong and continues to improve. Do you, um, I'm interested in knowing other levels of government, particularly the state. How was your relationship with the state? Do you get positive um, feedback? Uh, are there hiccups? Is there any way you could see that I could help champion some of the other conversations you try, if you're trying to have that are not as positive as you'd like for them to be? Well, the, May, um, the state office to prevent uh, domestic violence is our um, 
partner agency on the state level, and we work really well with that agency. We've partnered on initiatives during COVID. In fact, they sat in on our provider calls during COVID, and we sat in on their provider calls with the bigger state coalition partners and providers. Um, we, we have looked to them for guidance on certain issues, and they have looked to us for guidance on other issues. So the collaboration between the two offices uh, um, is really productive and, <clears throat> and um, we share information and communicate all the time. <clears throat> Wonderful. My understanding is as we're prior conversations that your staff has been able to assist with the court process. We have. Um, and, and folks are able to use our family justice centers to file for remote orders of protection or to um, actually um, appear in family court. And we're also prioritizing working outside of the criminal justice system because we recognize that not everyone wants a criminal justice answer. So we're really looking towards how both we continue with those relationships and continue with those collaborations, but also develop strong relationships outside of the criminal justice system that can address the needs of survivors. Because not everyone wants to call the police or wants to go to court. And, and just out of curiosity's sake, I'm sure the answer is no. <laughs> Has because conversations have been had to compensate for, for the extra efforts that you've taken on, or you've jumped in to be an extension of what I would say is it's family court. And now you've assisted with the documents that we needed to be prepared, getting more involved, more hands-on. How do, and how does, I think it was, the, the courts opened the 24th or they're, they're about to open? How was that conversation looking, if at all? The, um, I'm gonna let Liz jump in here, but I think the courts are still primarily virtual. Um, for many kinds of cases, but mm -hmm. we are also really able with our partner agencies to be able to help survivors access those systems when and if they need to. Liz, please. Sure. Um, so I'll just add that we've been working closely with the court system since the implementation of their remote filing programming. Um, we were one of the first jurisdictions in the state um, to pilot it and um, through the support of our nonprofit providers who are directly providing those services to clients. Um, we've had a really strong collaboration and I think we were um, very welcoming of being able to bring that service on site to the family justice centers and in communities throughout the city. Um, it was a great need that survivors had and we've been excited to partner with OCA in implementing it. Thank you, thank you very much. As, as I've shared earlier, I worked for the shelter system for 13 years and I'm, I'm data driven and I like to follow the money. Often in conversations, I hear, it's not our conversation with, with you with us, go to DSS, DSS or go to HRA. I'm trying to see where the loopholes are, if there's cracks in the system. So to me, that means follow, follow the money. I, I like a, a breakdown and it's not gonna be today, I understand that because I, I I'm trying to follow the dollars and the organizations that you're attached to that receive dollars. How difficult would, would that be? And how soon can, can I receive that? Also, what I'm looking to do as funds have been restored, if I, if I need to advocate to make sure that funding that was taken away can be put back in, I also want to be able to do that. And I only see being able to do that by having your true data in a, in a timely fashion. Thank you. Well, um, we can certainly follow up with your office around uh, those issues. Thank you. Chloe, is there, has anyone raised their hand? Is there a member that has raised their hand? Uh, at this time, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function. If you have a question for the administration, we'll just give them a, few, a minute. I see no hands raised at this time. Okay, then I'll continue with another budget conversation. My understanding is that there's over 75 providers that still not received um, their monies. 
Have you heard that conversation? And um, do you see light at the end of this tunnel? I find it difficult for organizations to, to be strapped. Okay. Um, NGBV has a contract portfolio that lives both with HRA and MOCJ. We do not oversee every single domestic violence contract in the city. We only oversee those contracts that are in our portfolio, but those contracts are also administered by these two entities, HRA and MOCJ. As far as, and, and in terms of our own contracts, the contracts that we, we, are, we oversee, we have not heard of any substantial issue. Um, we, we've addressed many of the early COVID asks with those contracts along with our um, uh, sister agencies. But if you are aware of a provider that is a contractor of ours, meaning on one of our contracts, we'd be happy to take a look at that issue. Thank you. Thank you for your willingness. In your, in your dream bucket, right? In my, the world of fantasy, I might, that's where I like to go right now. Do you see uh, another way that we can assist victims? Is, is there someone that's trying to think outside the box is getting maybe some resistance? You know, do you have, what would be your ask? If, if, I, if you had a magic, if I was that genie in a bottle, <laughs> I could expedite something, what would that you see different? I think, you know, based on what we've both heard from our partners and survivors, I think there are a lot of needs out there that survivors have. But one major one is housing, being okay. able to access housing in ways that make sense. We all know that that's a scarce commodity in New York City, and it's also very challenging for survivors in navigating those systems. Um, that's a primary one, thinking about how survivors can, in fact, just have access to uh, the sort of flexible funding kinds of models that support whatever they might need. Those are some of the challenges that we hear from both our provider community as well as survivors out there. When it comes to dividing the housing for DV victims, my understand, I, I like to know, do you have a, a, a facility that only services men? Like how, how, how do we deal? I, I, I know it's slim to few that, that come forward, but I, in my shelter experience, I had maybe five men, you know, that were DV and, and was with, with, with me. And it was more so because there wasn't this identified where they could go, it's always been women that will house in, in DV shelters? I, again, I think it, this is a question that would best be responded to by DSS. Um, but I think that we also need to understand that the shelter system that exists right now for domestic violence survivors is a shelter system that serves survivors and their children. So if you are a survivor, and you have children, be that male or female, you could be housed in one of those facilities. Survivors and their children, their families, all right? Their, no, I, their families. I, I understand that and I look perplexed. That's scary to me being a survivor, to have a man next door to me or, or that I have to exchange with in, in the common area. So hopefully that's, a, that's something that we can change I understand it's a DSS HRA issue. It doesn't fall onto you, but I hope that we can work and, and next year when we're having this conversation, it's changed. You know, we, you know, we, there's, there's triggers. And, and, we would, and, and, and for the men as well, if they've been abused of by a woman, it, it could, you could relive the, the, the situation. But I, I know it's bigger and it is, is deeper. Um, than that, um, I'm I'm going to start to um, to turning. Oh, of my co there's no one else. Of my colleagues that have questions, I I like to begin to hear from. I'm going to say not the you know the, those that are here to um, advocate 
rather or either for themselves or the nonprofits that have signed up as, as well. Chloe, can you remind everyone of, of our role today? <laughs> Thank you, Chair Diaz. Thank you. We have concluded the administration's testimony and will now turn to public testimony. First, I'd like to remind everyone that I will call the call you up in individual call up individuals and panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony once the sergeant at arms sets the clock and gives you the cue. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. Remember that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel of testimony in order of speaking will be the Honorable Judy Harris Kluger from Sanctuary for Families, Lana Hamash from the Arab American Family Support Center, and Helen Hung from the Korean American Family Service Center. I will now call on the Honorable Kluger. You may begin your when. Will... Your time will begin now. Good morning. Um, my name is Jennifer Friedman. I'm the director of Sanctuary for Families Family Law Practices in the Bronx and Manhattan Family Justice Centers. I'm appearing today on behalf of the Honorable Judy Kluger, executive director of Sanctuary for Families. We are New York City's largest provider of comprehensive services and outreach exclusively for survivors of domestic violence and sex trafficking. We are so grateful for the opportunity to testify today with special thanks to Chairperson Diaz and personally Chairperson Diaz for your um, bravery and candor. And I appreciate your being a warrior. I love that term. I'm going to adopt it um, as we continue to, to assist our clients um, who are survivors. Thank um, you. The council has recognized that gender violence is a serious public health crisis in its own right, exacerbated by the pandemic. Today, I am pleased to report on the rapid, highly efficient crisis response of the mayor's office and GBV and the New York City Family Justice Centers in the past year. As a longtime FJC partner agency providing many services, adult and children's counseling, family law and immigration legal services, and economic stability services at the centers, the FJCs, we were profoundly grateful for NGBV's leadership in this unprecedented time. We wanna commend Commissioner Noel, key staff, including Jennifer DeCarly and Janice Jenkins for their fast, effective transition of FJC services and coordination to the, um, of the government and nonprofit partners at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, NGB also deserves praise for their sustained efforts. Um, yikes. Yikes, my apologies. My pages went out of order. Throughout the year, <laughs> not merely keeping FJC services functioning efficiently, but coordinating advocacy to improve other systems that were not working as well. Oh, that was So I understand my time expired. Do I have one second to close? You have 60 seconds. Okay. I just want to add that one of the biggest challenges that we faced was the family courts um, really being quite inaccessible to our clients throughout much of the pandemic. They are opening back up. They have made great strides. Um, much of the work that had been the work of the family courts, including drafting petitions, was offloaded to nonprofits such as Sanctuary and Safe Horizon and others. The Family Justice Centers did a phenomenal job help, helping to coordinate this influx, this kind of tidal wave of new cases that came into the FJCs. But we did want to point out that that has been a tremendous challenge for survivors throughout the pandemic. And we also would be happy to speak about the reopening of the FJCs. We look forward to that. We appreciate the FJCs and NGBVs coordination of that in a safe way and in a way that enables us to continue hybrid services, which we have been providing. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you um, for your testimony. And I wanna share with you that late yesterday afternoon, I received an email from one of your clients 
asking me for housing assistance. You know, and she, she made a very good statement. She was, she was linked to a unit and because the countertop, I think it's not six inches long, um, the unit is being denied to her. And what she stated, again, she stated clearly that she was living in a unit with no counter space. So definitely I, I emailed the commissioner, um, emailed the managing agent that she's working with, is willing to work with, with the family. Um, and I'll get back to you on that, but just know that any case that comes through my office, I'm gonna look at and I will be hands-on. Housing is a human right. I, I've been homeless, it was a month, but it was enough. I know displacement. And there's no reason why we should not be able to accommodate especially when a developer, a managing agent is willing to take in one of our families. So I'll, I'll share with you after this, the conference, the hearing today, who the family is, but I do want you to know that I take my cases seriously and my staff knows that. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Chloe. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Lana Kamash. Good your morning. time will begin. Okay. All right. Um, good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking um, Committee Chair Diaz for her personal testimony, as well as the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, and the entire New York City Council for holding this important oversight hearing. My name is Lana Hamash. I'm Priority Area Specialist at the Arab American Family Support Center. I'm honored to testify today on behalf of marginalized immigrant and refugee communities throughout New York City. At the Arab American Family Support Center, we've dedicated ourselves to creating an inclusive safe haven for immigrants and refugees since 1994. Um, our organization serves all who are in need, but with 26 years of experience, we've gained cultural and linguistic competency serving New York's growing Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian communities. The Arab American Family Support Center has remained open during COVID-19, offering uninterrupted service de delivery throughout the crisis. However, COVID-19 has created additional barriers for our, our organization and the community members we serve. For survivors of domestic and gender-based violence, social distancing directives to remain home can be frightening and dangerous. In fact, since the beginning of the public health crisis, the Arab American Family Support Center has witnessed a 40% increase in demand for our anti-violence program. Our agency supported over 1,400 survivors of domestic violence in 2020. Um, but in addition to an increase in demand, AFSC has witnessed an increases in cases that are high risk and high intensive, wherein the increase of stress that individuals are feeling um, as a result of COVID-19 um, ends up creating misplaced aggression towards partners and spouses. So at our organization, we define high risk clients as individuals whose cases involve one or more lethality factors. Notably, the proportion of high risk clients we serve, which was at approximately 3% in March, 2020, has increased um, to about 17% today. And at the peak of the pandemic sat at around 46%. Um, and particularly now that most um, family justice center buildings remain closed to visitors. Time has expired. All right, um, just to, to close quickly, um, we, we just request that the city um, prioritize funding for citywide initiatives that support services for survivors of GBV, particularly the job and immigrant survivors of domestic violence initiatives. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, for your testimony. I, I particularly, um, within my district, we definitely have a concentration, which I'm proud of, of um, Muslim, Arabs, and, and I like to know, as I continue to invest the discretionary funds and try to get my, my colleagues to fall in line with my thoughts and, and share the need, can you share with me, if not today, you know, via email later on, the date if you have any for the 37 councilmatic district, I'd like to know what the numbers are. I can definitely follow up with your office via email for with the specific numbers. We have them all broken down. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Helen Hung from the Korean American Family Service Center. Your time will begin. Thank you, 
Chair uh, Darmer Diaz, uh, Council Member Brad Lander, members of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, um, Mayor's Office on Gender-Based Violence, as well as the New York City Council for giving us the opportunity to testify today. My name is Helen Hung and I'm the Director of Development and Communications at the Korean American Family Service Center. KAFSC provides social services to immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. All our programs and services are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. 98% of our clients are immigrants, 98% are women, and 100% of our staff members are immigrants themselves or children of immigrant parents. And over 95% of our clients' first language is not English, and they come from low-income backgrounds. KFSC is proud to be an on-site partner at the Queens Family Justice Center, and we have worked with the QFJC as an on-site and off-site partner for more than 10 years. We're also grateful for the partnership with Safe Horizon, Mayor's Office to MGBV, and Commissioner Owell, and our Executive Director Chia Fisher is also an appointed member of the Mayor's Domestic Violence Fatality Review Committee. In 2020, all our best practices and expertise were challenged and stretched in ways we could never have imagined. We never closed our doors to the public, and within the first few months of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic turned our world upside down. Our 24-hour hotline saw a 300% increase in call volume within the first six weeks of New York State on pause, with 88% being related to domestic violence and sexual assault and child abuse. In 2019, we received a total of 2,119 calls on our hotline. We saw that number upended in the first six months of 2020. We served almost 2,000 survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault and provided almost 40,000 services related to domestic violence and sexual assault last year in 2020. Like Arab American Family Service Center, we saw an upward trend in the severity of abuse and also children as primary victims of abuse. Our frontline essential workers met the increased need and provided an in-person crisis intervention, counseling, case management, and other supportive services. Your time has expired. All in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. We look forward to working with all of you to establish an effective system for all our immigrants and immigrant survivors. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I would just like to remind everyone that you may send your written testimony in full to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will review all testimony in full and add it to the public record. At this time, before I turn to Chair Diaz for her questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Diaz? Well, at, at this time, I don't have a specific question, although I, I like to share with, with Lana, and by my co-host Lana, and, and also with Ms. Fesher, that prior to me coming on as a council member, I work for New York State Assemblyman Towns, and grew a love and, and a passion for seeking resources for individuals that were in need. And that grew to me co-founding a Bangladeshi driven organization within my, within my district. I share that to say that although I am obviously not of the community, I'm not Muslim, I'm not Bangladesh, I'm not Korean, I, I believe in equity. And, and I believe in, in going after where, where there's a need. So I, I want, just want you to know that I'm here for you. Um, I feel your pain. And, and I'm proud to say that 10 years ago, I, I knew enough to be part of the conversation and, and be part of the fight and, and the struggle. So I, I, I thank you for presenting today. And again, just want to say there's many council members that, that are here for you. Um, thank you. Thank you again for the testimonies. Thank you. Yes, seeing, ma'am. Seeing no council member questions, we will turn to the next panel. In order of speaking, we will have El Kamihira, Michelle Turner, and Amy Brosh. El, you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Your time will begin. Um, dear members of the New York City Council on Women and Gender Equity, I'm honored to give testimony today. 
my name is El Kamihira. I'm here as a survivor, activist, and, and also documentary filmmaker working on and tracking issues around violence against women. Um, I deeply appreciate and applaud the network of services for survivors and the help extended to women and children being victimized by male violence in New York, especially as COVID has exacerbated the desperate state of affairs. Um, today, though, I would like to report from what was being done in Connecticut, where about a dozen women a year are murdered by their male partners or exes, and the number uh, of uh, the number in New York are similar. Uh, I'm talking about Jennifer's Law, a law named after two women murdered by their abusive husbands. The bill seeks to expand the definition of domestic violence uh, from an incidence-based crime to a pattern crime over time to include coercive control and the full range of tactics used by abusers to control their victims, threat stalking, monitoring, intimidation, uh, restriction of resources, isolation, et cetera. The bill was passed by the Judiciary Committee and is now in front of the full General Assembly for a vote. Jennifer's Law is part of a worldwide trend to modernize domestic violence law to reflect what abuse actually is. Uh, from my own lived experience as a survivor and through my research, I know that physical violence is the tip of the iceberg of domestic abuse. The vast amount of abuse is non-physical and it's never isolated incidents, but rather a continuum of targeted destruction across all aspects of life. There's also a strong correlation between course of control and homicide, uh, which is why I would strongly encourage the powers that be in New York City to join Connecticut, California, Hawaii, the UK, Scotland, and many other countries to turn their attention to creating a legal framework through which we can stop men from abusing and controlling their female partners instead of only focusing on helping the women after the fact. Um, you know, we spend a lot of money and effort on, um, on services to victims uh, but we actually have not uh, been able to reduce women killed by male partners. And as you said before, COVID has uh, exposed a desperately large population of women trapped in those situations. Um, currently, a very tiny percentage of offenders are charged, even tinier percentage see jail time. Yet we accept that women have to leave their homes, go into hiding, essentially getting imprisoned themselves having to abandon their lives and uh, off, often disrupting work. And, you know, we talk about the shelter to poverty pipeline. Um, to my mind, we, must, we, we have to turn our attention to abusers and create real life consequences for them, um, perhaps removing him from the home instead and figure out how to intervene in what is a highly predictable and therefore preventable course of behavior. Thank you. I, I thank you. Thank you for being a warrior and, and advocating. You know, or, often it makes, a big, it makes a big deal to know that the voices that are not being heard or that fear to be heard, that we have warriors banding together to fight the fight. But thank you. And thank you also for being diligent and going outside the box and looking to other states to see what they're doing and assisting us in trying to change what we do here in New York City. Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd just like to make a couple of notes before we move on. Um, we will be adding Charlotte Kazin uh, after Amy Barash. And as a point of clarification, um, can we unmute Michelle Turner? Uh, are you testifying at the same time? Should we unmute Amy Barash at the same time? Could you clarify, Ms. Turner? Yes, I, I, I'm on mute. And I don't know how the system works, what you got to do, <laughs> what you get. I don't know. I just here to testify. OK. I can clarify that Ms. Turner is going to testify first, and then I will follow her. Thank okay. you, thank you, for the, thank you for the clarification. Michelle, you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Your time will begin now. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Turner and I am a survivor. I'm an immigrant here in New York and from this time I've been living here, I am a mom. I have an autism child. It's been hard for me 
the system has not put out enough effort to help me in any way. I am struggling with my child. All I can hear is like, go to the shelter. And it's not that I want, I don't want to go to the shelter. I want to feel like a woman. I want to feel back like, oh, I normally feel. And I've been hearing so much bad things about the shelter, but I get my work permit and I've been working. It expired. I send it back to get a, a new work permit. It takes almost a year. I've been reaching out saying that I, I can't survive without this work permit. Nobody, no, no one. I, I, I have no response, nothing at all. I've been struggling with my child. I'm all alone. I'm a single mom. There's a lot of women that I have to be counseling my own. I've been hurting and I have to be counseling a lot of women too, to know that no, 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 no killing, no taking your own life. Don't give up because I've been through it. I've been through it so bad that I was pregnant during my hurt. I was pregnant. I could have lost my child. So I've been telling women my age, younger than me, I've become a counselor. I have to be talking to women, telling them, hold on, better is coming. I would like for the city to put more effort because there's people out there that is hurting and I'm talking from the heart. They are hurting. And when I listen to everyone telling me what they're going through, it hurt my heart, knowing that I am hurting too. And I have to be doing this all alone by myself with my artistic child. And I'm gonna continue doing this. I want you to stay encouraged. Please do. As I said earlier, prior to coming, becoming a council member, I worked for the shelter system and I had a, a mom who came in from Ecuador. She met a husband there. He was a, a New York City resident. He brought her here. And the moment she got to the door with her child, with her son, his mom had an issue and that led her to being in shelter. She was in shelter for five years. As I was leaving shelter, she was leaving into a permanent home. When, when one of the battles that we dealt with was her work permit and her employer refusing to give her the extension. So I'll, I'll make it my business to help you we get a copy of, of the order that was given to anyone that was waiting for a work permit to be able to show the, the letter that came in um, to support individuals in your situation to continue to be employed. So you, my understanding is you give them your, your work permit with, with the document that says you applied prior to COVID and then the employer is, your employer is supposed to accept that document and, and allow you to gain employment if you were employed and you lost it during. Again, feel free. I, it's a federal issue, but I'm, I'm willing to help you navigate yeah. the process if, if you hit a roadblock, continue to hit a roadblock. I just got it back still. I got oh, it back just the other day. Good for you. I just got it back. But I'm still out of work. I'm still suffering. Okay. So I can't get free. my for my baby. Nothing. I, so. I want you to know that Councilwoman Diaz, it's here to serve. I cannot guarantee you're going to find employment, but I like to help you in, in your process to the pursuit of gaining employment. That's, that's, okay, my, my staff is, is more than willing to assist. No, I have employment. I work with an agency, but I can't go to work because there's wow. no daycare for the baby. And um, they're telling me that some daycare is telling me a bunch of money where I'm not going, I'm not working now. I'm going to school. I'm going to Century for family. That's the school I'm going now. So I can't do nothing. The baby is stuck with me. No daycare. I can't pay daycare. I'm, I'm getting only food stamp. That's the only help. They kick him how out. Old, of how old is your child? He's three. He's three. And you have no daycare, no daycare subsidy? They cut him off at the daycare. Okay. They cut well, him off. I, 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 have, I have interest in, in your situation after the hearing. Let's reconnect on Monday and then see if there's any way that my office can advocate for you because what you're telling me um, is questionable. 
as, as, as to why you're not being provided child care services for, for your child. I, I'd like to look into your situation a little further, if you would allow me. Yes, I Thank will. You. I need the help. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Chloe. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Amy Brosh of Her Justice. <clears throat> Good morning. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Diaz and the entire Committee on Women and Gender Equity for the opportunity to testify today on the impact COVID has had on victims of domestic violence. Um, the woman from whom you just heard, Michelle Turner, is actually a client of Her Justice, and I think she also said that she has been working with Sanctuary for Families. Um, we would welcome your help, uh, Chair Diaz, if there's anything additional you can do. Um, but as you can hear, even with really dedicated and skilled advocates and attorneys by her side, the challenges remain, unfortunately, for victims of partner violence. So I'm very honored to follow Michelle Turner, and I thank her for being willing and brave enough to share her story with the council this morning. Um, we have submitted written testimony, which is very comprehensive. So with my time today, I just want to highlight two key issues. The inability over the past year to access a vital range of civil legal remedies beyond orders of protection and the lack of public information about the functioning of the family courts. A theme running through both of those issues is the digital divide in our city, which has created further barriers for women like our clients trying to seek assistance. When the pandemic hit, the New York City family courts closed. While some in-person court will resume for the first time in late May, up until now, everything has been virtual. And as um, Commissioner Noel mentioned, many of us have put rooms at the disposal of our clients so that they can appear remotely from our offices since they don't necessarily have access to the equipment or safe and reliable Wi-Fi. Family courts quickly reopened for requests for orders of protection. Since then, they've also opened for matters that they deem essential. Unfortunately, the court's definition of essential often does not match that of our clients. And for a case to be deemed essential, an argument must be made to a judge and decisions are ad hoc based on the assessment of each jurist. While people with lawyers have been able to file such motions, not all, all applications are granted. And for litigants who are unrepresented, the majority of those who file in family court, that route has been unavailable. While making orders of protection quickly available was a very welcome move on the part of the courts. Um, that is not the only or often the best solution for the many- time victims. has expired. Please give another 60 seconds, please. Thank you, Chair. Financial support from partners and clear and safe schedules for access to children can often be more critical. Um, for single mothers living in poverty, child support can be a critical source of income. For immigrant victims who are not eligible for public benefits or most federal COVID relief, it may be the only source of income. So-called non-essential child support cases have not been heard since last March. In addition, custody visitation cases have also been typically deemed non-essential even though co-parenting with an abusive partner can be very dangerous and COVID complicated this ability for separated parents to make decisions about time with children because of work instability, public health mandates and constantly changing school situations. Finally, while the courts have been adjusting their operations on a regular basis, they do not have a clear and accessible way to communicate those changes to the general public. So as lawyers, we get regular memos, but for a court to disproportionately see low-income unrepresented litigants, the community confusion about whether, how, and when the courts were available was deep and persist. I would encourage the council to um, speak with the courts about making sure that that information is regularly and accessibly available for litigants in many languages other than English. This has been a long 14 months with no change in public communication. We're very grateful for City Council's continued support of survivors in New York City, and the need for legal support for DV victims is as real and as urgent as ever. We hope that in this moment of recovery, the Council will reaffirm and enhance resources to survivors and recognize legal services as essential to ensuring their economic well being and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just have one question. Being that it's all digital, and we work, most folks have been working from home, I'm interested in knowing. When a case is not going to be heard, well, do they, how much notice are, are you being given? They know it's intense, not only for the attorneys to prepare, but for the victims or those that are involved to you know, testify or go through their process. So you're giving, I don't know, what does it look yeah, like? So it, honestly, um, Chair, it's very sporadic. So cases that were filed at the earlier part of the pandemic we often didn't even get notice about when future court dates were going to be held. 
Some of them are still in limbo, whereas other cases that, that have been filed more recently, we've been getting court dates. So I can't give you one <laughs> constant answer, unfortunately. It's been very chaotic. And we very much appreciate this, the complexity for the court system. But if we're finding it chaotic and hard to understand, it's impossible for somebody without an attorney really to understand how to proceed. So the answer is it really varies by county, by case type, and even by judge. Wow, I, I can't imagine how difficult it, it, it must be for you as attorneys, as, as an agency, and then for, for the victims. Thank you, thank you for your testimony, and I look forward to reading what you submitted. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Next and last on this panel, we will hear from Charlotte Kazin. You may begin once the sergeant gives you the cue. Your time will begin now. Uh, my name is Charlotte Kaysen. I'm speaking on behalf of the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. Uh, the Alliance stands in support of INT number 2131 because we recognize the strong intersection between domestic violence, poverty, and lack of internet access. Lack of internet access presents a pr profound barrier to economic stability and a survivor's path to healing. Further, we recognize that community and internet centers may provide a safe haven for survivors who are enduring technological abuse. We resonate with community-oriented orient policies that help shatter the cycle of violence. We believe IPV cannot be addressed without also addressing social factors, especially in the context of a pandemic that is causing substantial isolation. We recognize technology is a crucial means for survivors to maintain access to informal and formal support networks. We understand domestic violence victims contend with isolation from their support networks, and which leaves survivors in a more vulnerable position to their abusers. We recognize lack of internet access constrains a survivor's access to vital resources as there is a symbiotic relationship between service providers and technology. We recognize that internet access is a key access point and a lifeline for remote help for survivors. Uh, we recognize that in the aftermath of an abusive relationship, a survivor may find themselves in a compromised situation, um, contending with sabotage economic opportunities and debt. A survivor may be navigating the intricacies of the criminal justice system while contending with li limited economic options. We recognize that through internet access, a survivor can access vital support supports and social service providers, which are paramount to serve them in their healing and empowerment process. This need is heightened during the, this unprecedented crisis where survivors' access to informal and formal supports is further limited. In consideration of service providers' reliance on phone services, um, serv service providers play a crucial role in recognizing safety concerns and supporting victims who reach out, including assessing risks and creating a safety plan to support victims. We recognize that stable access to internet safeguards and protects domestic violence survivors. Furthermore, research and our work on the ground shows us that technology facilitated abuse is pervasive in IPV situations. Um, may I have a more one more minute? I'll give you 90 seconds. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, technology is often weaponized by abusers to intimidate, threaten, and stalk their victims. An abuser may surveil, monitor, or hack their victim's devices without the victim's knowledge. Abusers also wheel technology as a tool to facilitate coercive control. A significant number of IPV survivors say that they have experienced technological surveillance, such as having spyware software installed on their devices by their computers. Uh, community centers for Wi-Fi may provide a safe and secure method for accessing support for victims for abusers who, who are monitoring their internet usage. Um, in sum, we are in support of community-oriented solutions to domestic violence. We recognize that community Wi-Fi centers may be a tremendous instrument of change. We affirm a policies which expand efforts to provide stability and economic prosperity to domestic violence survivors. Too often, domestic violence survivors become trapped and relegated in the cycle of violence and poverty. We are in favor of a policy framework that expands access to internet and the ability for survivors to thrive. Um, additionally, a working group um, program will provide us the opportunity to collect more re reliable data on the scope and intersection of domestic violence and social factors. This gives us the opportunity to identify patterns and windows for social change, to craft public policies to serve the unique needs of survivors. In conclusion, we recognize that domestic violence represents a force of tremendous upheaval and trauma. We, we, we believe the bill represents a powerful investment in solutions to alleviate the domestic violence crisis. We recognize that providing pathways to employment and resources advances the welfare and survivors of their families. Um, we recognize that it's a driving force of poverty and displacement. We support a, pol a policy framework that fortifies survivors and help them build independent lives. Uh, we believe the law is a momentous step towards dim dismantling obstacles which hinder a survivor's path to healing and stability. We recognize that internet access is a critical safety net for survivors. We are supportive of approaches that enable survivors to access the vital current resources needed to address threats to their health and safety. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak 
um, in front of you. Um, once again, I'm on behalf of the New York City Alliance Against Sexual Assault. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Chloe, do we have any, my understanding is there may be um, other members that are still on? Before yes. we close today's hearing, just want to give them an opportunity if there is a closing statement on their behalf that they'd like to, to present. We actually have uh, one more panel after oh. next. Yes. Uh, no, uh, no council member questions at this time. Do you have any additional questions for this panel? I do not, thank you. Okay, we will move on to our next and last panel. First, we'll hear from Hyatt Barrett, and I apologize for any mispronunciations from the New York Legal Assistance Group, Haley Nolasco from the Center for Court Innovation, and Molly Burke of Lyft. I apologize, Haley. Uh, may, you may uh, begin your, with your testimony once the sergeant gives you the cue, uh, Hyatt Barrett. The time will begin now. Good afternoon, good uh, afternoon, and thank you, Chair Diaz, council members, and staff for the opportunity to testify. My name is Hyatt Barrett, and I'm a senior staff and coordinating attorney at the New York Legal Assistance Group's Domestic Violence Law Unit. As a result of COVID-19, there was an increase in reported domestic violence in New York City, which was reflective of what we saw at NILAG, where the numbers of callers requesting help and filing orders of protection more than doubled during COVID-19. To pivot, NILAG set up dedicated COVID-19 hotlines partnered to receive and assist survivors in filing orders of protection on the same day and worked with the Family Justice Center as a non-contract partner for family law. Still, the few resources that are available for survivors of domestic violence substantially disadvantage those living in poverty and immigrant communities. Access is one of the most vital lessons learned from this pandemic. The pandemic required creative solutions to respond to clients in need. It would be a shame to lose that which we have learned and implemented. What we did helped. We saw a 150% increase in people calling us to obtain orders of protection, all of whom we assisted. Further, with remote access to clients with technology, we're able to serve clients who otherwise may be unable to receive services, people who live in home with abusers and can't take the time for a full meeting in person safely, but can coordinate safe times to speak in 30 minutes intervals, people who are in the hospital and cannot come for an appointment at the FJCs, but can call and have a full legal consult from the hospital room. In DVLU, we speak over 11 languages, greatly helping us meet clients' needs in their preferred language. What we also know is there are large unmet needs for those who we still haven't been able to access help. We know that there will be a flood of survivors in need of court intervention once courts open up, especially when there is so much financial instability. An increase in sustained long-term funding to agencies like NILAG and to expand the FJCs to allow them to contract with more providers like NILAG to serve more individuals is the only way to ensure that we can continue to respond to these intersecting needs of clients and meet the spike in individuals needing services when courts open up. We have and continue to prepare to respond to the long-term crisis to come after this immediate crisis passes. When that time comes, we must be available with appropriate funding to meet this anticipated need or we risk sending survivors back into the arms of their abusers. I wanna thank you again for this opportunity. I thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, you will hear from Haley Nolasco. The time will begin now. Good afternoon, Chair Diaz and esteemed council members of the Committee of Women and Gender Equity. My name is Haley Nolasco, my pronouns are she and her. And as someone that has experienced IPV, this testimony is especially meaningful to me. The Center for Court Innovation has greatly supported the vision embraced by the council to reduce unnecessary and harmful in involvement in the criminal legal system and build sustainable community-led public safety solutions. The populations we serve are facing a multitude of crises that continue to disproportionately impact black and brown communities. This includes intimate partner violence, which has been all the more prevalent during COVID-19. The city's current approach to, to addressing intimate partner violence has supported many in moving towards safety. Yet in recent years, we have seen incidents of IPV not decreasing, but instead remaining stagnant and even rising in some areas. There is a growing need for community-based approaches which are not relying on the criminal legal responses. And these responses are not adequate to address IPV in all cases. For many black and brown communities, relying on criminal legal systems is not an effective or safe option due to the criminalization of survivors of IPV and the current and historical harm these systems have caused. The pandemic has left many New Yorkers more physically isolated, dealing with increased stress, trauma, and less access to trusted community partners and credible messengers. 
This, is re this has resulted in less opportunity and security for those who need help. And the center's programs work hard to implement virtual services across the city, but we know that many experiencing IPV are not able to access these services virtually due to the lack of private spaces in, low in close living quarters. Models like the center's RISE project, um, Reimagining Intimacy Through Social Engagement, which I direct, draws from the Cure Violence model and is a, pro and is a part of the city's New York City crisis management system, offering supports to end IPV-related gun violence. Gun violence has surged over 200% in 2020 and has motivated policymakers and community members to call for real solutions. In New York City, neighborhoods that are experiencing the highest rates of gun violence also have the highest rate of IPV-related gun violence, um, IPV-related incidents. Additionally, uh, firearm access, once associated um, with guns, we have a 500 to, uh, five times risk of IPV-related homicide happening. Um, these are recent cases that magnify the need for more of these the services. time has expired. Can, Can I we give us 60 more seconds, please? How much time do you, how much more time do you need? I need like 90 seconds. Okay, I'll give you 90. If I can, I'll, I'll, rush, I'll rush it through. So no, I just I, I, wanna, I'm sorry, uh, I don't want you to rush it through. Cause I, I, no, no, <laughs> I definitely see a need in what you're saying and I want to be able to absorb it. Okay. Thank you so much, I appreciate that so much. Thank you. So we lift the lives of Rashida Barzi and her two daughters in Brownsville, Nichelle Thomas in Park Slope, and Ramona Rodriguez Reynoso in Washington Heights, who all recently lost their lives to intimate partner-related gun violence. So community-based responses allow RISE, organizations like RISE, to focus on prevention and address the fact that not everyone who abuses interacts with the criminal justice system and that mandated responses are limited. Most people experiencing IPV don't call hotlines or services, and individuals are more likely to reach out to people actually within their own networks. Further, in bridging the digital divide that we've been discussing, the center is also pilot piloting the public access terminal court hub, also known as Patch, in Brownsville, to offer more direct access services to um, kiosks in ki with kiosks for civil housing and family issues. And these services are free and open to the public. This option for survivors is extremely important and we are very happy to be able to pilot this because it's much needed. In closing, the center has a wealth of experience around domestic violence and Red Hook. Red Hook Cares offers client center support for survivors of violence. And further, the, the center's gender and family justice team has developed training in partnership with the administration to best support survivors and also engage people causing harm. So through collaborating with communities and stakeholders, the center really hopes to continue continue to respond to the challenges and impacts of intimate partner violence. And the city can also do, the, do this through supporting meaningful community-led programming. We thank the council for its continued partnership in this work and thank you, Chair. So I, I thank you. I'd like to hear a little more about the community-based approach. If I understood correctly, there's, there's a deficiency. Can you let me know more about what you, what you are citing to be a deficiency? Like what, how, how can we be more, what, what are you seeing? What, what's the trauma? What are, what are we missing? Can we please unmute the last one? Thank you. Okay, so some of, so our community approach, we have, so what we have been doing, we have been having community conversations and helping to change the norms that allow for intimate partner violence to even exist, right? So a lot of community-based, um, offering technical assistance to the queer violence programs that exist throughout the city. So that's upwards of um, now 23 organizations and is now increasing. So also going in the community and meeting people where they're at. This is not something that folks typically speak about. So we go into community to really start this conversation so people know that there is a safe space outside of current systems that exist to get the support they need. For folks that have actually um, gone through traditional routes to get support dealing with IPV, what we have been hearing is that um, oftentimes they're afraid um, and we could see many reasons why communities of color are afraid to call law enforcement. Sometimes they don't see, um, they, they may not be feeling like they're being seen or feel protected. Um, and oftentimes, although very well intentioned, sometimes the um, current supports that currently exist aren't meeting all of their needs. So that's what we have been seeing also there's a big gap in working with people that are actually causing the harm, which is one of our main focuses. Um, so what we have been doing is really working with people to offer one-on-one -on -one support and group-based support as well to really work with this lens of transformative justice to really help people build, get to that root cause of why they're causing harm. Because when somebody starts to harm, um, that's not the first time that they may have experienced harm. So really getting to that root cause to actually stop harm from continuing to happen. And um, many people also that have been experiencing these issues, um, and I think you had also alluded to this before as well, Chair, uh, many people want just want to know why that person is behaving that way and why they're causing the harm because they want their partner to be better. Um, so they really want that support and oftentimes don't really want them to go through the system as well. So that's a lot of what we have been seeing on the ground. 
So I, I'm someone that likes to have, likes to have or influence positive conversations. And when I've been, been in conversation with the administration and trying to have a pure violence group within the 37 councilmatic district, which we don't have one, mm -hmm. I my what I want to call my group is influencers as opposed to interrupters. Do you have an opinion toward that? You know, as you like, I'm more about preventing a situation than reacting to it. So I, I like to know what your thought is. And if you can't answer me now, that's fine. Feel free to reach out to me so we can have that fake on let you a little coffee and tea. And, and I, I like to pick your brain mm -hmm. because I, I definitely see a need to prevent situations. Mm -hmm. you know, often abusers, it's not their intention. I, you know, it's, 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 it's become their social norm. Mm -hmm. you know, at times, I'm not, I'm not making excuses for anyone, but I think it'd be a divine world if we can prevent as, as many um, situations as possible and, and get abusers help, you know, if, if, if we can before things escalate. So influencers vice versus interrupters, that's my, my question. How does, how does it sound to you? Well, I actually think that they they can they can actually live together in one and the same because if someone is a, a credible messenger, they can also influence. So you may not always have to be somebody interrupting violence, but you can be a person that people respect in community and like you're from the community, you represent the community, and you can have these conversa conversations to help influence that change that you're talking about. So I think there's still ways of interrupting, but like you can be an interrupter and also be that influencer, or you could be that credible messenger that's just from the community that's really starting to have these conversations like how we're having at the center about how do we have a healthy relationship? What is toxic masculinity? How do we get to these root issues, um, you know, to really stop these behaviors that are causing violence, not only in our streets, but also in our homes. So really working um, in that aspect. And we could, I'll definitely take you up on that Cafe Con Leche because we could talk about this for, for a while. Um, it means but, a lot to me. um, I, I like to. Mm -hmm, I'm sorry? Yes. It oh, means course, a lot to me. I, I'm glad that you welcomed me to the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think there's a lot of synergy that could happen. And um, like recently, we uh, like we give out a lot of public education materials. Like we're really out on the ground um, so, talking with community members. Our palm cards have quotes about like, what does a healthy relationship look like? What does the intersection of gun violence and intimate partner violence look like? And we use that to start conversations with folks in the community. And you'd be surprised how many people actually want to talk about this issue and just have never been able to get the space. And like the other day, um, we were actually in Brownsville. A lot of members of my team were in Brownsville with some of the other care violence providers. And uh, we we had went up to an individual that was talking about um, a DV case that they had in the past. And I found a way to start to talk to that individual. And that person actually was saying, oh, wow, I never thought about it this way. You know, I would love, you know, and, and that was interesting. You know, sometimes we, we, we may think like, oh, maybe somebody doesn't want to talk about it. But you'd be surprised when you're on the ground speaking to folks how how interested people are in this, in, in this specific issue and how many people want help and just a safe space to talk about it and get the resources that they need. I, I thank you for choosing to do what you do. Thank you. you know, um, positive vibes and please stay safe. Likewise, thank you. Because you're, you're definitely in a boost on the ground position and I know it can be challenging. So again, th thank you. And for my office, my schedule, let's have Cafe Con Leche. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to the last witness on this panel, I'd like to... Uh, ask if we have inadvertently missed anyone else who is here to testify to please use the raise hand function in Zoom and we will call you on another panel. Uh, next, we have Molly Burke of Lyft. You may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Diaz for the opportunity to testify and for sharing your story with this morning with us. My name is Molly Burke and I'm the Bronx Staff Attorney of Legal Information for Families Today, usually called LIFT. I'm here today to tell you about some of our work in domestic violence cases. LIFT is one of the few organizations in New York City that works directly with pro se litigants. 80% of the thousands of family court litigants are unrepresented for issues fundamental to the well being of children, such as child support, custody, visitation, and protection in domestic violence cases. The pandemic has had a profound impact on the operations of the family court. The court is operating completely virtually and until recently was only hearing cases deemed to be emergencies. Although domestic violence cases have, have been deemed to be emergencies, there is a huge backlog of other cases to be addressed over the next several months or years. 
Now in our 25th year of serving New York City's families, Lyft works with litigants to achieve their legal goals during a time of unprecedented crisis. Over the past year, we have provided about 25,000 New York families with services ranging from quick answers to in-depth legal guidance. We served mothers 45% and fathers 39%, as well as grandparents and other relatives and non-relatives. More than 76% are people of color and 14% are monolingual Spanish speaking. Lyft's legal model is different from other agencies who work on cases of domestic violence. While other agencies have expertise in helping clients get orders of protection and provide essential safety planning services, some survivors do not want to get orders of protection because they do not want to involve the police, they're fearful of retaliation from the non-custodial parent, or they are afraid of exposing their immigration status in court. These are the domestic violence clients who come to Lyft. We focus on survivors who have issues related to their children, on getting custody, visitation, or child support orders. Lyft also works with families in which there is an interest in maintaining some degree of connection between the children and the person who causes harm. Safety is the most important issue, but even as there are not enough programs for survivors of domestic violence, there are almost no... Please give her another 60 seconds if she needs it, please. Thank you, Chair Diaz. You're welcome. But even as there are not enough programs for survivors of domestic violence, there are almost no successful programs to address the emotional and psychological issues of people who cause harm. Lyft works with men on a variety of family related issues and is supportive of the development of these kinds of abuse partner intervention programs. Currently, I represent Lyft on the Lawyers Committee Against Domestic Violence, which works in New York City and New York State. I am the co-chair of the Legislative Subcommittee advocating for policy reform and legislative change. Lyft also works closely with the Mayor's Office to End Gender-Based Violence through the Family Justice Centers, where we work once a month in three different boroughs. I would now like to share the story of one of my clients. Akila is the custodial mother of her beautiful two-year-old daughter, Megan. Akila was referred to us after her daughter's father, Eddie, showed up at her apartment and demanded custody of Megan after having been absent for Megan's entire life. Akila had already filed for paternity and child support before the COVID-19 pandemic, and she was confused how Eddie could be simultaneously demanding custody while denying paternity and refusing to provide any financial support. Akila and I discussed her custody rights and Akila determined that she did not want to file for an order of protection or for custody at that time. Instead, we were able to focus on her paternity and child support hearings. After almost a year of waiting due to the pandemic, Akila was finally able to establish paternity and now has a temporary order of child support that will be finalized in the coming months. Akila, who came to us terrified of Eddie's power, was now able to advocate for herself and her daughter in her hearings against Eddie's hired attorney and through Eddie's repeated attempts to delay the case. Akila's case will be finalized soon, but she knows that should she ever need to return to family court, she now has the right information and an advocate ready to champion her through Lyft. Lyft supports all efforts to increase funding for services related to domestic violence, for the survivors, for the people who cause harm, and particularly for the children who get caught in the cycle of abuse. As the levels of domestic violence has skyrocketed during the pandemic, we hope the New York City Council will continue its long-time commitment to the safety and security for all families and will continue to make this area a high priority for funding and for innovative programming. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I, I thank you. And I'm hoping you have submitted your, your testimony today because yeah. I, I, I want to go back and, and read it carefully. You, your organization seems to have a holistic approach. Yes. And, and I'm open to, to learning more about that because as, as a functioning society that's not always so functional, it's, it's good to know that we have organizations out there that are thinking outside the box that are maybe taking life experience and, and applying that knowledge. You know, as someone, I, I hold the VA in human services and if I learned anything um, during my process was learning to speak to to the person in, in, in front of me. And, and that takes stepping outside the box. You know, going from a concept paper, from a book, you know, to actually apply. I'm rather just smiling because it means that, that we're here, you know, as, as, as they say. And when we're dealing with the both parties, the moms and, and, and the dad, we definitely want to ensure that the little people, the children don't fall to the cracks and that their emotional needs are also being met. 
So I, I thank you again for what sounds as if it's an organization that stretches its limits and goes to thinking outside the box. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your testimony. I'm going to make one more call for any witnesses we may have inadvertently missed and also make a call for council members to use the raise hand function Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Seeing no hands raised, I will turn back to you, Chair Diaz, if you have any additional questions. No, I, I do not. Great, so last order of business, I'd like to remind everyone, you may send your written testimony up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Diaz, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I wanna start off by thanking you all for giving me the strength to tell my story this morning. I didn't know, I know I was gonna start my day was, was be somewhat emotional and, and nervous, but um, I didn't know how it was gonna end. So, so thank you for the positive faces and the feedback that you've given to me. It's, it's my junk and it's my message. So thank you for creating an environment that allowed me to enter into a not so comfort zone and walk away from this hearing proud to have stepped forward and, and share my story. And I'm hoping that I've helped someone today. You know, there are resources available and we have maybe gained more peers today that would have never thought that they could have been an extension or an assistance to someone. I'd like to thank the commissioner for being a part of the conversation today. I know some of the questions were not easy. I wanna thank my staff, my extended staff, my committee staff, Brenda McKinley, Chloe Rivera, Monica People, Karen Cherry and Richard. Putting this hearing together, was extremely tough for, for my committee. When I was diagnosed um, positive for COVID, the committee worked to make sure that today can be made possible. So thank you all for being a part of my process. Have a wonderful weekend and enjoy your time and looking forward for, to more deep conversations and positive resolutions. Um, thank you, adjourn. Okay, we've ended the live. Thank you, everyone.